the, the epiphany co call it, O oh God, who by the leading of a star it's manifest thy only begotten Son to the Gentiles, mercifully grant that we which know thee by faith may after this life have the fruition and fullness of the beatic, beatific vision of the Godhead through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, we begin with um, Professor Diarmaid McCulloch's Thomas Cranmer, page one, actually. We've been through this book a number of times, and the time has come for a review. So we're in the introduction. This book tells a man's life story and tries to do it as far as possible in sequence. It is selective in what it tells of the story. Although well, readers may find that hard to believe in what has ended up as an extensive text. Certainly it is not an impartial narrative. As I've written the tale, I've afforded myself the luxury of having opinions about the actions, motives, and influence of one who attracted controversy and wildly polarized com comment in his life and in his manner of death. Ever since he was burned at the stake in Oxford in 1556, Thomas' story, Cranmer's story, has been frequently told in two completely contrasting ways either as the villain or hero. In either case, the narrator's prime intention has been to comment on a larger story, that of the Church of England, to legitimize the church or to dismiss it, to present it as Catholic or as evangelical in character. There's good reason for doing this. It is impossible to disentangle Cranmer's career from the confused maneuvers which led to the birth of one strand of world Christianity, the Anglican Communion. Cranmer's own reticence encourages this identification of his own story with the larger narrative of public affairs. He was a very private man who habitually hid his emotion as his admiring servant and early biographer, Ralph Maurice, tells us, quote, this is from the narratives of the Reformation, 244 to 45. Let's see if I can find that. I've been looking for that for ages. He was a man of such temperature of nature, or rather so mortified that no manner of prosperity or adversity could alter or change his accustomed conditions. For, being the storms never so terrible or odious, or the prosperous state of the time never so pleasant, joyous, or acceptable, to the face of the world his countenance, sleep, and diet commonly never altered or changed, so that they were most nearest and conversant about him, never or seldom perceived by sign or token of countenance how the affairs of the prince or the realm went. Notwithstanding privately with his secret and special friends, he would shed forth many bitter tears, lamenting the misery and calamities of the world. Those friends have not betrayed their confidence in Cranmer's private, let's close quote, Cranmer's private face remains, for the most part, inscrutable. A telling instance of his own separation of the private and public is that in more than 300 letters of which, of which his survive, there is only one mention of his second wife and children for whom he had risked his <coughs> career in the church. The silence persists even in the days of Edward VI when he openly displayed his family with pride and joy. A single reference comes in a letter to Martin Bucer, another married theologian who had come to play a central role in his thinking and who might count as one of his special 
and secret friends, a footnote. For a more detailed discussion of the usage, see McCulloch, Henry VIII, and the early Reformation in McCulloch's editor, Reign of Henry VIII. And for a wise discussion of the imprecision of early reformist stances, see Ives and Boleyn in the early Reformation. If one compares Cranmer's correspondence with the undisciplined yet sparkling flow of words from his lifelong rival, Stephen Gardner, his letters are controlled and circumspect, and they contain a few jokes. The margins of the surviving books from his great library, clearly one of his passions, are frequently covered in his notes. With a few exceptions, which I will explore, they are part of his elaborate classified filing system for research, and they studiously avoid expressing opinions except under the interrogation of the most keen-eyed researcher. It's interesting. For the most part, therefore, this life story will be of the public man, Often the reader will feel that it is a recital of decisions and events in Parliament and the Council Chamber with Cranmer as a passive spectator. Often that probably reflects reality. One relentlessly repeated usage in the text may strike some readers as eccentric. In common with many Tudor historians today, I use the word evangelical to describe the religious reformism which developed in England during the 1520s and 1530s, excluding the terms like Protestant or Lutheran, which create problems at this early stage in the Reformation. Protestant as a term, as a usage, did not become naturalized in England until the reign of Mary after 1553. 15, yes, quote, Lutheran unacceptably narrows the sources for reformist views in Henry VIII's England, and both of them give undue precision to people's outlooks amid a countless number of individual rebellions, often confused and sometimes temporary against the traditional church and its assumptions. Evangelicalism is the religious outlook which makes the primary point of Christian reference the good news of the Evangelion, or the text of Scripture, generally. It is a conveniently vague catch-all term which can be applied across the board, except to a very small minority of English re religious rebels who proceeded further towards continental radicalism. In the 19th century, the term was appropriated in the English-speaking world to describe a party within Protestantism and within the Church of England, but it can be liberated once more to perform a useful task for the religious history of Tudor England. Similarly, some readers may object to my characterization of the religion of Sir Thomas More, Bishop John Fisher, and the vast majority of the population of England up to the 1540s as conservative or traditionalist. I am well aware there is a Whiggish ring to these usages, and that viewed from the perspective of Erasmian humanism in the 1500s or 1510s, they are incomprehensible. They are not meant to imply that the religion of Cranmer and his reformist colleagues was in some way more progressive or more modern than that of Moore, Fisher, or Erasmus, though it is noticeable that the supporters of the late medieval version of Catholicism were fond of terming their opponents men of the new learning. To term the late medieval Western Church Catholic without further explanation begs too many questions, 
and the usage would certainly have infuriated Thomas Cranmer in the second half of his career. One can hardly deny that the struggles over religion from the beginning of the 1520s up to the death of the Archbishop in 1556, the dynamic of events was that of old world devotion struggling to conserve and maintain its identity against a new religious outlook which aimed to destroy it and replace it with something reformed. Unsatisfactory as the labels conservative and traditionalist may seem, they, they are the best which a narrative of early Tudor England can do without lapsing into anachronism and partisanship. With the consciousness of discordant voices of the past, I do not seek to make Thomas Cranmer into either a hero or a villain. Like most of us, he could be both. Although in his mature evangelical theology, he would violently have disagreed that one could be both saint and sinner. Disagreed with that. All sinners, all are sinners until rescued by God. Is he suggesting the denial of Simul Eustace at Peccator? <clears throat> Frequently, Cranmer's actions can legitimately be assessed in sharply contrasting ways. Yet readers should be aware that I retain a wary affection for the Church of England, of which he was primate for more than 20 years, and which has shaped my own identity. If there is a bias in this narrative, it is sympathy for a man who was frequently confused and who confused others. There's also an admiration for the way in which he struggled to a final gesture of certainty in his last hour. As, have I, as I have looked at what we know of Cranmer, I have concluded that those who told the hero narrative generally have generally distorted fewer elements of the evidence than those who hold the villain narrative. It is for the readers now to decide whether they agree with me. All quotations in the text and footnotes and most titles of contemporary books have been modernized. As far as possible, I've rendered place and personal names in a consistent modern form according to the languages from which they've come. One notable expression, exception is Strasbourg, B-O-U-R-G, which I have called Strasbourg, B-U-R-G, throughout. It seems pointless to use the French form for a city, which was overwhelmingly Germanic in its dominant class and cultural stance in the 16th century. Names of continental figures with a very common English equivalent have been rendered in the English form, and certain academics who adopt Latinized forms of their surnames are referred to in that form. There ends the introduction. And now for chapter one. Uh, chapter one, the Simple Esquire, 1489 to 1503. As Lockton in Nottinghamshire does its secular and sacred best to commemorate its most famous child, one of the two pubs in the center of the little village has been christened the Cranmer Arms, with a sign proudly displaying the family heraldry. When the Victorians built a new parish church there, Three centuries after the Reformation, disposed of the chapel. Three centuries after the Reformation, disposed of the chapel which Cranmer had known. Huh. They dedicated the building to St. Thomas, a delicate gesture fraught with characteristic Anglican ambiguity. The prime dedicatee was the apostle who was the patron saint of the intellectually curious. 
Behind him were the shadows of two archbishops of Canterbury who died defying their monarch in the name of conscience, Thomas Beckett and Thomas Cranmer. There are hints of all three in the stained glass installed in the church in 1989 to commemorate the fifth centenary of Cranmer's birth. St. Thomas's an economical 1890s essay in early English by Sir Reginald Blomfeld is thus a decorous icon of doubt and scruples of conscience, but also serves as a antinel, N-T-I-N-E-L, at the approach to the site of Cranmer's first home, a large expanse of meadow enclosed by trees and containing a series of grassy hummocks. The small moat, known as Cranmer's Mound, is probably Norman, most prominent among the complex series of earthworks around it are two rectangular ditched platforms to its east, on which probably stood the late medieval house. The Cranmers had arrived in as Lockton from Sutterton on the wall on the wash in Lincolnshire seven or eight decades before the future archbishop was born. It came through the marriage of Thomas's great-grandfather Edmund with the heiress of Aslockton or the Haslerton family. It was a good match for Edmund Cranmer, for the Aslocktons were of knight's degree. Bolstered by this descent, Thomas's father, Thomas Sr., styled himself an esquire in his will, although his wealth was probably dangerously modest to claim such a status. Neither the township of Aslockton nor the Cranmer family were of great account by themselves, as Lockton did not have its own parish church, its little medieval chapel, of Holy Trinity is now rather amorphously represented in the stonework of a cottage in the village main street. The building used to be known as Cranmer's Mission House. A secular age has toned this down to Cranmer's Cottage. The name which it now bears on a plaque Thomas Cranmer Sr. dutifully bequeathed half a mark to Holy Trinity Chapel, but he was buried in the much grander parish church at Watton, of which parish the township of Aslockton formed a part. Watton Church was no more than a quarter mile's walk from Aslockton. If two stream courses were not in flood, and the Cranmers clearly appreciated a burial beside the stately earlier tombs of knights and clergy. We've got a picture of the tombstone slab of Archbishop Cranmer's father, who died in 1501, drawn by John Graham Wallace, inscription transcribed and translated by Peter Newman Brooks, reads, Hic Yacket Thomas Cornmar, Armager qui obit, uncesimo septimo die mensis mae anno, denai di millisemo. Here, I'll just give the translation. Here lies Thomas Cranmer, gentleman, who died on the 27th of the month of May, in the year of the Lord, 1501. May God have mercy on his soul. The family chose not to compete too brashly with the armored effigies and tomb chests of Hugh de Newmarch and Sir Richard de Watton, for they bought an incised limestone slab for Thomas and had him prepare, portrayed, not very elegantly, in civilian clothes. 
a double admission that there were limits to their purse and to their current social pretensions. Nevertheless, the Cranmers were determined to make their claim to ancient lineage. The two shields on Thomas's senior slab ignored not only his marriage to Agnes Hatfield, but all the other 15th century Cranmer generations. And instead, beside the arms of Cranmer were placed the shield of Newmarch. <clears throat> As on the early 14th century tomb chest of Hugh. In his years of greatness, the archbishop would continue this heraldic sign of obstinate family pride in his new March ancestry. And he emphasized to his... <coughs> Secretary Ralph Maurice that he'd been educated in gentlemanly pursuits. Maurice also remembered him arguing in 1540 with a room full of Henry VIII's legal and financial advisors about the education of the humble. He recalled Cranmer robustly reminding them that all present were gentlemen born as I think. The Cranmer's prickly and precarious self-esteem would have been wounded by some later statements that the archbishop was of yeoman stock. Cranmer placed him, his family in the social order very precisely many years afterwards in a delicate put down for Bishop Stephen Gardner. Although Gardner's family origins in, Suff in a Suffolk market town had not bequeathed him any coat armor, Cranmer pretended to assume a common social origin with his bitter foe. Drawing attention to their Episcopal titles, the Archbishop said, quote, I pray, thee, pray God that we, being called to the name of lords, have not forgotten our own baser states, that we were once simple esquires. The Cranmer heraldry is more problematically vari varied than for most families of the six early 16th century, variations which must reflect the family struggle to maintain a status which its present circumstances made dubious. Even the normal heraldic complications caused by the need of archbishops to impale their family arms with the arms of the Sea of Canterbury cannot fully explain the vagaries of Thomas Cranmer's heraldic achievements. The shield, which appears as Cranmer arms on Thomas Sr.'s tomb slab from 1501, is a chevron between two cranes. And it is this which appears on the illustrious son's signet or personal seal, duly impaled with new march, and then quartered with the coat of the Archbishop Hatfield's mother. The simple and therefore impressively ancient Cranmer coat also appears on his prerogative seal as Archbishop. Very soon after he became Archbishop, Cranmer decided to alter his personal arms, apparently wanting something which was distinctively his own. The birds, apparently cranes, and a typically heraldic pun on the Cranmer name, were changed to pelicans to give symbolism to the bird's legendary willingness to feed its young with its own blood. This typology of Christ's bloodshedding for humanity on the cross appealed to the evangelicalism which the Nottinghamshire squire's son had now embraced. The Archbishop's heraldic alteration may have consciously also sought to contrast with the action of his predecessor, but one in the Sea of Canterbury. And we've got up 
top here, Cranmer's personal seal from a wax impression with his signature above. Cranmer, ancient impaling Newmarch quarters, Hatfield. Down below, we've got Archbishop Cranmer's arms in modish, modishly Renaissance style on a glass panel, probably from one of his palaces. Sea of Canterbury impaling Cranmer with pelicans as Archbishop quartering unknown coat and with a crescent for difference. Cranmer's motto, Nosca Tipsum et Deum, is misspelt Nosca Te Ipsum et Deum. And uh, over here it's got Cranmer's first official seal used for his personal action as Archbishop. Note the arms at Dexter. Well, anyways, go on here. Henry Dean, who had also adopted birds in his coat armor. However, Dean had taken the unprecedented step of referring to the symbol of Thomas Beckett, three chose or Beckett's in the coat which he bore. Cranmer's opinion in the 1530s would have been that Dean had thus identified himself with a traitor to the English crown. Additionally, Cranmer added the three cinquefoils from his mother's arms to the family chevron, and then to his new coat was complete, together with a punctiliously added crescent to show that he was a younger son. The revised heraldry appears first on the seal which Cranmer hastily cannibalized from a matrix used by his predecessor, Archbishop Warm, using it to authenticate his official actions undertaken in person as soon as he was made Archbishop in 1533. It can be seen as identifying the Archbishop on the title page of the Great Bible, 1539, and it occurs in stained glass, which must have adorned one of his homes in the 1540s. In good feudal fashion, it seems to have been the model for the coat of arms assumed by at least two of his household servants, Peter Heyman and John Sanford. Yet Cranmer did not altogether forget the older family court coat with its claim to ancient blood. The heraldry on his signet and on his faculty seal continued to display w without any crescent and additionally the faculty seal conjured up from the past in its quartering the six lions of the Aslochtons, remote medieval nightly splendors recalled amid Renaissance clerical splendor. The Cl Cranmers were not the clients of any great noble family. The occupants of Belvoir Castle, a few miles to the southeast of Watton, dominated the surrounding countryside, both earlier and later. But in Cranmer's boyhood, the castle was a derelict shell. It was abandoned after the 15th century civil wars and subsequently the timber of the roofs uncovered rotted away and the soil between the walls at last grew full of elders. Nottinghamshire County politics under Henry VII was dominated by a few gentry families in particular Sir Henry Willoughby of Woloton near Nottingham. If we want to gauge the important period people in young Thomas's life, we must now turn to his father Thomas's will. This was a fairly brief document dated on the day of his death as recorded on his tomb, 27 May, 1501. Just check ahead here. Going up to page 15. The elder Thomas had probably made most of the necessary arrangements elsewhere. There are no signs in the will 
of any looming family disagreements over the inheritance of the heir, his son John. Thomas Sr. made no elaborate provisions for masses. But the will shows every sign of a household in which clergy loomed large. Watton Church was to get a new bell, and the testator's clergyman brother, John, was a witness. But most striking was the family's link with the great Primont Strottensi and Abbey of Welbeck, the patron of the living of Watton. Abbot Thomas Witter of Welbeck was to be supervisor, and two canons of the house were among the witnesses of the will. One of them, the vicar of Watton, soon to be abbot at Welbeck, Thomas Wilkinson. The family connection probably continued in later years. At Welbeck's dissolution in 1538, among the monks were William Hatfield and John Marshall, the family names respectively of Archbishop Cranmer's mother and grandmother, and the main purchaser of Welbeck, Richard Wally, married both of his sons to the daughters of Cranmer's cousin and servant, Hatfield. Welbeck was a flourishing house in 1501. After a bad patch in the 15th century, Wider and his two predecessors vigorously promoted reform as the impressed visitor of the order repeatedly attested in 1512. Welbuck was promoted to be head house of the Primonstratensians in England and Abbot Wilkinson as ex officio visitor general. The future archbishop would have known English monastic life at its best when he was a boy. Perhaps the Welbeck Association, which inspired the elder Thomas to make sure that two of, two of his three sons, Thomas and Edmund, got a good education, the essential preparation for clerical careers. For they, they both got modest annual allowances of 20 shillings in their father's will. One of their sisters, Alice, went off to become a Cistercian nun at Stixwold in Lincolnshire. She was sacristan at Stixwold by 1430, 1525. However, one should also consider the other clergy whom the Cranmer children would have known, Stixwold nunnery at first sight a long way off, and a puzzling choice for Alice Cranmer provides some of the clues. The Gentry families gave the Cranmer boys plenty of models for eventual clerical vocations and the direction of their careers. First, the Cranmer's near kin, the Tamworths, a Lincolnshire family based both at Leek near the old Cranmer home at Sutterton and at Halstead Hall, a mile to the north of Stixwold Priory. Energetic and talented, by 1520s, family members had become well entrenched in the Exchequer administration in London. One of the most distinguished early members was the Cambridge Don, Dr. Christopher Tam Tamworth, fellow of God's house, probably from the 1490s, and a collector of ecclesiastical preferment, mostly in Lincolnshire, which culminated in price centership of Lincoln Cathedral in 1538. More socially elevated were the Cliftons of Clifton near Nottingham. Here the crucial figure was Sir Gervais Clifton, who died in 1491 when Thomas Cranmer was two. One of many heads of the Clifton family called Gervais, he demonstrated his talents in successfully convincing Edward IV, Richard III, and Henry VII of his political indispensability in the Midlands. 
Sir Gervais turned his worldly success to an unmistakably fervent, pious energy. Perhaps in the shadow of his relative Lawrence Booth, Archbishop of York, for whom he acted as a fee fee. What do you want? Um, I was wondering if you'd come check it when you're done. Yeah, I will. Clifton showed, just carry on. Okay. He repeated the family name of Gervais, but was inspired to call a second son Protasius. And his other offspring included Gamaliel, Silvius, Eliezer, uh, Adelina. Moreover, these children did not disappoint their father's devout expectations. Four of his sons went to Cambridge, and his eldest boy, Robert, went so far as to renounce his inheritance to his younger brother, Gervais, in order to pursue an academic career at Michael House. The Cranmer connection with the prodigious Clifton dynasty is not immediately obvious. It needs to be reconstructed from fragments of evidence. Sir Gervais had been the royal receiver of the lordships of Watton and Aslockton since 1477, so he would have had routine contacts with the gentry family of the parish, the Cranmers. The prioress of Stixwold in 1510 was... Alice Clifton, although her relationship with Sir G Gervais's family is not clear. <clears throat> However, Sir G Gervais's son, the Michael House Don Robert, was also rector of Bucknell, a church a couple of miles from Stixwold Priory and closely associated with it. And he left the fur of his gown to Sir Robert of Stixwold, evidently a priest attached either to the priory or the parish church there. Robert's brother Gamaliel proved more of a high flyer, pursuing his canon law studies at Turin as well as Cambridge. Unfortunately, we seem unable to identify the Cambridge College to which he belonged. Among Gamaliel's many East Midlands performance, per performance was a selection of benefices around Aslockton, including from 1500 the Nottinghamshire Rectory of Houghton. Oh boy. The Molios of Houghton were a third set of gentry relatives might have provided a possible pattern of the future for an academically inclined boy. Dr. Clifton's patron at Houghton, Sir Thomas Molyneux, was a younger son of the great family Sefton in Lancashire. He built himself a brilliant legal career under Edward IV and Henry VII. One of his daughters married one of Cranmer's Hatfield relatives, of his sons, rough contemporaries of the Archbishop in age, two boys went to Oxford, one imitating Sir Thomas's legal success, the other running, returning to Oxford career to the church. The fellowship at Magdalen and a rectory of the main family living at Selfton. The Molyneux were among the Cranmer's relatives who approached the Archbishop for help during the 1530s where they were trying to speed up a chancery lawsuit. Yet Cranmer's life and career pattern followed that of the Tamworths and the Cliftons to Cambridge rather than to Oxford. Similarly, his career suggests few links with the West and North The alignment with Lancashire, was, which was clearly still important to the Molyneux of Hotterton, it is noticeable that the focus of much of the clerical careers of Dr. Christopher Tamworth and the clerical Cliftons was Lincoln Cathedral and Lincolnshire. It was in the Wolds east of Lincoln that Alice Cranmer chose to enter the monastic life of Stixwold. 
A good road runs due east from Nottingham via Watton across the higher country around Grantham to Boston and the fens of South Lincolnshire from where the Cranmers had originally come. Cranmer's closest lifelong friends were both Lincolnshire men, Thomas Goodrich from near Boston and the future Bishop of Eli and Lord Chancellor, George Whittle, Cranmer's personal chaplain throughout his years as Archbishop. Goodrich and Whitwell had been in school together from the age of seven, and all three boys ended up at Jesus College, Cambridge. We've got a footnote here on Goodrich and Whitwell's early career. See the testimony of Whitwell, Cranmer's register. Whitwell was parson of the Jesus Urban Parish of All Saints during the 1520s. Cranmer made him a chaplain as soon as he became an archbishop and parson of Lambeth when it became vacant. Cranmer's register for Whitwell's will and its Lincolnshire references see this, that, the other. The world in which the young Thomas Cranmer grew up seems to have been structured on a triangle comprising the urban centers of Nottingham, Lincoln, and Boston. Cranmer's schooling remains a mystery. At first, it was probably in the village. His early anonymous biographer talks of him learning grammar of a rude parish clerk. And Archbishop Parker's biography talks of Cranmer's father encouraging him to hunt, hawk, shoot, and enjoy the sports of a gentleman. And in order to preserve in order to preserve his enthusiasm for his studies. This may suggest an early education at home. Later, he seems to have gone off to a grammar school of which he had terrifying memories. Perhaps it was at Southwell, or perhaps it was near his various relatives in Lincolnshire. However, at the age of 14, his torments at the hands of marvelous severe and cruel schoolmasters was at an end. The son of a pious family was sent off to a new college at Cambridge to launch an academic career. And here ends chapter one. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.